Right then guys, it's PSL here, and I'm here for my 11th and final episode in my Power Stages series on Dirt 4. So that means there's only one category of rally car left to look at, and I left it to last because it houses the most powerful and final top flight two-wheel drive rally cars ever made. The Group B regulation cars have a fierce reputation, but at least the latter ones had the decency of having four-wheel drive. But forget those four-wheel drive cars because it's these I was the most concerned about. Yes, they have much less power. For example, the Lancia 037 has 330 horsepower. That's a lot for only the back wheels to put down on gravel, but it's still about 150 less than the Quattro and 205 were churning out only three years later. But the fact of the matter is this, the proving ground is on a loose gravel surface and these two early 80s cars have some of, if not the highest ever, amount of horsepower per driven wheel. But that's not the only reason I left this category to the end of the series, in fact the other reason is because there's only two cars here, and it's obvious which one's the quickest. The Lancia 037 is the final rear wheel drive rally car ever to win a World Rally Championship, as staggeringly Lancia beat Audi's in the very near future dominant Quattro by just two points over the course of the 1983 season. And it's not like Audi were new to rallying either, as this was the third season in which the Quattro was racing, and even then Lancia still beat Audi. But don't expect this car to be setting a new stage record. Yes, in the previous episode the Quattro ended up as the 5th quickest car and was less than 4 seconds off the top. But trust me, the rate of development was so fast that the Quattro that lost to Lancia in 83 was completely different and blatantly inferior to the Audi we saw in the last episode, which was from 1986. So that's the iconic and historically rich Lancia 037, and its rival is this, the Opel Manta 400. Uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, this car has nowhere near as much history as the 037, but then again, it's too new to have even had a chance. This car was first used midway through the 1983 season, and that's way too late. Opel were busy developing a new rear-wheel drive car at the same time as Audi were revolutionising rallying with four-wheel drive, and Peugeot, Ford and even Lancia were all turning their attentions towards all-wheel drive. This car was made at a time when the rear-wheel drive recipe, if you will, was becoming less and less successful. It's like buying a ticket to a football match and then turning up during the 80th minute. Yes, you still might see the most pivotal moment of the match, but you've turned up so late that you've probably already missed it, and what's the point of even turning up at all? The Opel Manta was outdated the second it debuted, and it's statistically inferior to the Lancia 037. It's got 55 less horsepower than its only real rival, and that's because the Lancia has a supercharger and this doesn't. So it's down on power, it accelerates at a noticeably slower rate, and it's not a championship winning car unlike its Italian rival. In the end, the Opel stage time was 2 minutes and 58.569 seconds. I'll say where that places it in the leaderboard later on in this video, because, well, the other reason I left this category until the very end of the series was so I could talk about an entire rallying category, as well as the final finishing order of all the cars this series, without the video being overly long. Anyway, before I forget, I'll quickly tell you what this car is like to drive, assuming anyone actually wants to know. And to describe this car succinctly, I'd say it feels like a good old American muscle car. Not only does it look a bit like a 60s Ford Thunderbird, but it also feels as long as one and has many of the same performance characteristics. It feels heavy, it feels big, and as such, it does understeer. So the way to counteract that is to drift into every corner, in other words, deliberately oversteering to cancel out the car's inherent understeer. I may be painting a bad picture for this car, and yes, it's quite a bit slower than the O37, but the Manta is by far and away the easiest Group B car to drive, partly because it is the slowest. But it's impossible to stay mad at a car that sounds like this. Up, past junction, 100, dip. Bump, bridge, 100 through dip, and crest, jump maybe, 80, dip, crest, 
100. It's such a deep and manly bellow, and it is without a shadow of a doubt one of the best sounding cars in the game. Before I can talk about the overall series standings, I need to drive one last car. I've already talked about the Lancia 037's history and successes, but let me just reiterate why I deliberately left this category and thus this car until last. It's only rear wheel drive yet it has 330 horsepower, which on tarmac wouldn't be a big deal, but this car was built in the early 80s and it's going to be driven off road. That changes things a lot. It changes things so much that even going around hairpins is tricky. It's one of the very few cars in the game that I had to be cautious going back on the power purely because if I wasn't then I'd be doing donuts forever. Lancia just about beat Audi to the manufacturer's championship in 1983, but there's no chance of the 037 beating the Quattro here. So instead, how close can it get and just how far up the overall leaderboard can this legendary rally car get? For one final time this series, thanks again Nicky and away we go. And this Lancia, it just shot off the line, of course thanks to the supercharger already at the bridge and that was wild heading into there so we're down this straight and actually it's looking pretty solid for the time being although suddenly the straight doesn't appear to be very straight, we're just weaving from side to side. That's the lack of grip, that really is, I mean we saw the four wheel drive rally cars in the previous episode. It, I mean, the cars were just too quick. The Peugeot, the suspension let it down there. Thankfully, I got around the hairpin uh, without doing donuts, without the rears spinning up excessively there. But uh, no, with the four-wheel drive Group B cars, it was always the suspension that let it down, or just the sheer speed you were going at. No, with here, the reason that the straight seemed remarkably not straight was because of just the lack of grip I could actually get off of these rear tyres. But actually... This car's pretty good. Now, I said the Opel Manta felt a bit American. It did feel heavy and big and long. And actually, according to this game, both the 037 and the Manta weigh the same. But I don't believe that for a second. Certainly, the Opel Manta is longer. And this car feels lighter. It is light-footed. That is how I would describe this car. The Manta, it just felt, it felt like an American muscle car. This is nimble. It's light-footed. Um, probably the rear-wheel drive helps that out a lot. Because I think... Having a lack of grip certainly does actually help to make the car more nimble and more responsive, overly responsive, but um, assuming you can actually control the car, it's not that bad. And actually, in a weird way, kind of easier than the four-wheel drive cars purely because this car is actually slower. Not massively slower, but um, yeah, with the Group B cars, the four-wheel drive Group B cars, it, the, the limiting factor was you as a driver but here ooh, not particularly great around that hairpin actually but that's the thing is I don't want to be cautious going around um, the hairpins because I'm just worried I will spin up the rears and then that's it stage over but no with the four-wheel drive cars the limiting factor is the driver simply put those cars are just engineering masterpieces no with here it's um it's the engineering that lets it down it is the rear wheel drive but if there is ever a rear wheel drive rally car I'd want to drive, it is this one, this is just perfect. Uh, nimble, light footed, responsive, maybe overly responsive, but it's got 3 engine 30 horsepower, what do you expect? And we're coming around the final corner, we're well into the final split, and 3 engine 30 horsepower, the supercharger whirring away, and we're coming up towards the final corner, past the fence, there you go, we got a brake, oh, a bit deep into the corner, but yeah, careful on the power, reasonably careful. And we're going to shoot out towards the line, again the supercharger, helping this car out, and that is a stage of 2 minutes and 55.9. So, there you go, that's actually pretty good. Much quicker than the Opal and this 037. Well, it was quick, it's iconic, it was perfect, and actually surprisingly controlled for a Group B car. And that's that. The final car in this series has completed the Kangaroo Farm stage in a time of 2 minutes and 55.904 seconds. That's 2.6 seconds quicker than the Opel Manta and places the 037 17th in the overall leaderboard. 
The 037 is the third quickest two-wheel drive car, just behind the two F2 kit cars, but the 037 is the fastest rear-wheel drive car in the game. Overall though, the Lancia is just about in the top half of the table, and what a table it is. You've got the Lancia Delta S4 at the top, with a 2 minute 45.1 stage time. And just quickly scanning downwards, you've got the Hyundai R5 in second, and a good 2.4 seconds behind the Delta. The MG Metro has got to be the biggest surprise, to be the 4th quickest car overall, and the 2nd quickest Group B car. Below that you get to the Ford Focuses, Subaru and Pretzers, and the other more toned down and refined version of the Lancia Delta, which is only 5.3 seconds slower than its more powerful predecessor. But it also shows that the Lancia Delta, in whichever guise, quick accelerating, responsive, good handling, controllable at high speed, thanks to a decently set up suspension which lets down some of her cars. The Delta is rallying perfection, so it's no wonder why the Delta S4 is the quickest car in this series, and the Delta Integrale is the quickest Group A car and is statistically the most successful car in rallying. The second page has got the F2 kit cars, of course the Lancia 037 and the Renault 5 Turbo, all of which beat the Mitsubishi Evo 6 and Evo 10, as well as McRae's championship winning 1995 Impreza. In fact, even the mightily impressive Fiat 131 beat McRae's Impreza. That result in particular is a bit unrealistic. As if this was real life and all the cars were driven by a professional, I highly doubt the Fiat 131 would be that close to the 1995 Impreza. I said the Metro was the most surprising car this series. Well, actually, I'd have to say it's the plucky and brilliant Fiat 131 instead because the quality of cars it beat is truly astonishing and I don't think anyone would have predicted that. On the final page, there's the Opel Ascona from the H3 category. It's a pretty underwhelming car, and if you want to know in detail why, then be sure to check out my video on the H3 category, and the same goes for all of the other cars and categories in this game. Anyway, whilst the 037 is the final rear-wheel drive car to win a World Rally Championship, the Opel Ascona actually won the Drivers' Championship with Walter Roll at the wheel in 1982. That means the Ascona is the last rear-wheel drive car to win a Drivers' Championship in World Rallying. And yes, the Audi Quattro was competing at the time and was in its second season. So the Ascona faced the Quattro and won. The difference is, the Quattro improved massively in grip, power, everything. And the Ascona didn't. Also on this final page you've got the likes of the Mark II Escort, the BMW M3, the Peugeot 205 GTI, the 2R2 cars, as well as the amazingly poor Ford Sierra Cosworth. The Sierra Cosworth had too much power, too much wheel spin, too much weight, and was in no way made to be a rally car, or even really a racing car of any kind if its performance in this game is anything to go by. So when I said the Fiat 131 is the most surprising car, well, what I meant was, it's the most surprisingly good car, because this here is the most surprisingly bad car. But even then, the Cosi was still nearly 14 seconds quicker than the Austin Mini Cooper, which itself was 4.5 seconds quicker than the only car it's even remotely comparable to, the Lancia Fulvia. So all in all, that means that the gap between the fastest and slowest cars in this game around this fairly short 3.38 mile stage is a whopping 41 whole seconds. With the Delta S4 at the top of the standings and the Fulvia at the bottom, that means Lancia have bookended this series, producing both the fastest and slowest rally cars in Dirt 4. I don't really want to turn this video and this series as a whole into a love letter for Lancia, but honestly, I think it should be to some extent. Lancia won 16 World Championships over their time in rallying, and that's bearing in mind they haven't competed since 1992. Lancia are the most successful manufacturer in rallying history, and I think this series proves that. Okay sure, the Fulvia was pretty bad and inferior in almost every way to the Mini Cooper, but every Lancia after the Fulvia was a class leader. 
the Stratos was only 13 thousandths of a second slower than its fellow H3 car, the Renault 5 Turbo. But the Renault was 11 years newer than the Stratos, and when you look at it like that, the Stratos beat 3 H3 cars from the 1980s and was almost exactly as quick as the cream of the crop. So the Stratos from 1974 beat cars that are almost 10 years newer than it. If that doesn't explain how good this car is, then I don't know what does. Then you've got the Lancia 037, which bested the Opel Manta and even the Audi Quattro in the 1983 season. The Lancia Delta then trounced the Group B category and lastly the Group A category. So as this series has proven, although Lancia being the most successful mark in world rallying should have given you a clue, but if you're in doubt over what rally car to pick, then pick a Lancia.